Welcome to our series on St. Matthew's Gospel. We are dealing with chapter 28 and the resurrection of Jesus. We have been speaking in our last episode about the angel who came down from heaven and removed the seal of the Sanhedrin and removed the block that would stop Jesus from coming out. You see, the Sanhedrin had worked out that if they put a seal on the stone, then even if Jesus did come to life, he wouldn't have any light inside. So he wouldn't even find the opening. And even if he could find the opening, it took several men to actually roll the stone in. He'd never managed to uh, uh, roll it back. So they were looking at Jesus uh, purely as a human person. They were not accepting him at all as the Son of God. So when the angel removes the, the stone, then you know you're dealing with God and you're dealing with his power. You're also dealing with his dimension, which is completely outside of our time and space. The reaction of the Roman army showed that this was also, we're dealing with God and uh, everything to do with him. And so they could do nothing. Now, one of the things that's written in between the lines that you might notice until I say it, then it becomes obvious. And that is the only person who can explain the empty tomb is that angel. Nobody else can. Nobody else knew what went on inside. And he was the only one who was able to perceive Jesus actually leaving the tomb because Jesus did not allow himself to be seen by those soldiers. So we have to ask the question, why didn't he allow the soldiers to see him? Now, when you put the four Gospels together and look at the evidence that they give you, you'll find that Jesus only showed himself to believers. He didn't show himself to unbelievers. So he did not show himself to the Sanhedrin. The amazing thing is the Sanhedrin got the message of the resurrection from foreigners, from outsiders. But they also got the truth. So this is a very important thing and we'll take it nice and slowly because there's so much in it. Um, but once the angel has declared the resurrection, then we have to deal with the reality that's actually there. So let's see what the angel did. The guards now are unable to do anything. But the angel spoke to the women and he said, there's no need for you to be afraid. That means there is need for these others. There's no need for you to be afraid. I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here. He has risen from the dead as he said he would. Now it's the as he said he would is the very important thing he had told them five times in Matthew's gospel, three times in the other gospels. I mean, how often do you need to hear something before you actually take it on board? Uh, and they had never taken on board the fact that Jesus would keep his word quite literally like that, simply because they all had come to the conclusion that it was not possible. And therefore, you know, once they knew he had been brutalized beyond recognition, then there was no recovery from that. So you'll notice that we put limits on God. We tell each other, there's something God can't do. And the scriptures uh, testify from the very beginning that there is nothing God can't do. Nothing is impossible with God, nothing. If I said nothing else to you but that, maybe I've solved a whole lot of your problems. There's nothing God can't do, nothing at all. Um, and so we're now dealing with the fact that Jesus is risen and that produces a whole lot of other questions. Where is he? How will we meet him? Will he show himself to us? How will we relate to him? Will he be very different? Um, how will things be between him and us since we all let him down? All kinds of questions uh, arise at this particular point. But before that, let me give you Revelation 1, 17 to 18 where Jesus showed himself uh, much later uh, to John, the one who wrote the book of Revelation. And he said to him, do not be afraid, it is I. Now, they're the words that he had said 
on the lake during the storm when the apostles first acknowledged him as the Son of God. They said, truly, you are the Son of God. When they saw him calming a storm and walking on water, they just could not believe it. But that's what he said to them that night. It is I, Ego Amy. So here he said, it is I. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, but now I am to live forever and forever. And I hold the keys of death and the underworld. Now, to hold the keys of death means that he is Lord. He's Pantocrator and he is Cosmocrator. He holds the keys of death. He has control of the future. And so he is the one that we have got to uh, take into account. But since he was dead and is now the living one who is going to live forever and forever, then the most terrifying nightmare of all human beings has been dealt with, and that is the tomb of rotten death. And the tomb of Jesus has never been closed. It has remained open for all the time since then. It has remained open for an entire era uh, to testify to us all that beyond the tomb there is life and there is heaven. But well, we've been told this by the prophets and I've already given you uh, in previous episodes, Isaiah 35, and I just want to remind you of verse 10. They shall come to Zion shouting for joy. Now Zion is the little hill on which Jerusalem is built. Uh, there will be everlasting joy on their faces. Joy and gladness will go with them and sorrow and lament will be no more. As soon as Jesus shows himself to these women, unfortunately, my Bible says that he said greetings. Now, Jewish people never say greetings to each other. They say shalom lach, peace be with you. But Jesus didn't say that. Jesus said, charite, rejoice greatly, is what he said. That's Easter, with everlasting joy on their faces. And all the sorrow and lament is all over. Now it's all joy and gladness. So what Jesus wants to tell us um, is that resurrection is the ultimate freedom. When you commit yourself to the Lord and get yourself on the road to holiness and union with God, you're actually walking the road of personal freedom. And when you reach union with God, you have reached freedom a complete interior freedom in which you are actually master of your own soul and you're able to give yourself to God uh, in, in great freedom. And so the thing that human beings are looking for, and it's wonderful to watch them on television and trying to find how to fly and how to uh, deal with the, all kinds of the elements and how to deal with the stars and how to deal with everything. And they don't know anything about the ultimate freedom that is within. The great freedom is the freedom to be your own person as God has created you and that person to be free of the domination of sin and sickness and death and hell. Ult ultimate freedom. And resurrection is also the ultimate exaltation of the body because eventually this poor little thing that has caused us a lot of pain and stress and everything, it will eventually join us in glory when all the tears will be wiped away and there will be permanent happiness and joy. But there's a little practical point I want to shove in here in case we take off. Uh, and that is that Jesus is completely outside of the petty power politics that's going on in Jerusalem now. They can't touch him. He's been caught inside during the Passion and has had to suffer grievously the battle that was going on between the powers of Rome and the Sanhedrin. But from where Jesus is now, all of that stuff is just nothing. It doesn't mean anything in the kingdom of heaven. And so when he told us to not give so much attention to that kind of thing and to give our attention to the kingdom of heaven, he was telling us to look to ultimate realities and to the great peace that God wanted to give to us. Um, because Jesus is risen from the dead, um, 
Ezekiel 37, verse 12, will now kick in. And that is that God had promised, one day I will raise you from your graves, O my people. In other words, because of him, we will also rise from the dead. And uh, the first res spiritual resurrection for us is baptism. There is a continuous resurrection for us in the sacrament of reconciliation. When we fall, we rise, okay? Um, there is the first resurrection when our souls leave the body and go back to God. And on the, the day, what we call the last day, the day of judgment, our bodies will join our souls for either resurrection or we won't think about the opposite today. Um, I've mentioned the custodia or the guards. We'll have to mention them several times here uh, because uh, God is going to use them in a way that they would never, ever have imagined or that we would ever have imagined. But if you know the, the way Matthew has presented his text right from the very beginning, Jesus was acknowledged by outsiders at the very beginning. He was acknowledged by outsiders at the cross and he will be acknowledged by these outsiders as well. They start off in the wrong place, of course. Uh, because this custodia, these guards, very different to the ones at the cross, uh, they were paid to keep Jesus in his tomb. That was that. That was their job. Uh, so if Jesus left his tomb, then they have completely failed and they will be severely punished. Um, so there's no way they're going to let him out of the tomb if they can do anything about it. So they start off by being opposed to what God is doing and what God wants to accomplish. These men live such a brutalized life that they could crucify a man as part of their day's work and go home and have a good night's sleep. It's all the same to them who this Jesus is. And they just think these Jews who are fighting over him, it's total madness. That's where they start off. In other words, they start off at zero point. They have no understanding whatsoever. And the first shock they get is when they get this supernatural intervention. But the angel now speaks and makes the Easter proclamation, not to them, but to the women. The Easter proclamation is given to the church. It's not actually given to the outsiders. It will be the church's duty to proclaim it to the outsiders and to uh, eventually bring them in. Uh, and so distinguishing between those two points is actually quite important. So the Easter exultet is given to the new ecclesia. Ecclesia means the gathering of God's people. And there is a new people of God now, and they have been formed during the time of Jesus' ministry. They don't even know they're ready to launch. They've no idea. They're all so distressed uh, by what has happened to Jesus. Um, and so just as the exultet is being proclaimed to the women, Matthew gives you another one of these little smiley moments, and that is that these brave Roman soldiers that have conquered the world run away. Now, you were told at the beginning of the Passion of Jesus that the brave apostles who said that they would lay down their lives for Jesus and defend him with their lives, they ran away as well, okay? And so what you're getting here is an illustration of uh, what is written in John 15:5 that Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. There's nothing we can do uh, spiritually without him. And so the angel acknowledges for the, the new ecclesia that this is dies dominica. This is the Lord's day. He's not here. Now, here is the place of the dead. You do not go looking for the living one in the place of the dead. Luke uh, draws that out much uh, more than Matthew does. He's not here. 
he has risen as he said he would. Now here is the message for the Ecclesia. Would you please take on board his words, his teaching, because that is your guideline for the future forevermore. You've got to remember his words. You've got to remember his teaching. You've got to remember a second, third thing, and that is God always keeps his promises. If God says he will do something, he does it. And the very fact that this has to be said to them means uh, that we understand that during the ministry of Jesus, that they hadn't really grasped at all who he was. Um, but these women are the first witnesses. And so the angel says, come and see. Come and see where they put him. This is very interesting. They're the very first witnesses from the church. And so they're invited to come and investigate. Now, if you have a long memory, I know you have, uh, go back to the very beginning of the public ministry of Jesus. And the very first disciples who left John the Baptist to join Jesus, and Jesus said to them, come and see. Come and experience this for yourself. But it was only the first ones. And here at the resurrection, it's only the disciples who are actually present who are invited to come and see either. Uh, so this was the uh, invitation that was given to them. And the women see that death's prison is empty. Women see that everything that Satan has done against God and against the Lord's anointed has been cancelled out. They see that. It's absolutely incredible. Uh, and so they deserve to see that because they had been so faithful. It's not because they're women. It's because they had been so faithful. Okay. To grasp something of what Matthew is trying to say to you here, I want to give you 1 Corinthians 15, verses 55 and 56. They're looking at the fact that death is swallowed up in victory. And so we can all say to death, death, where is your victory? Where is your sting? Now the sting of death is sin, because if you go into death in sin, there's an even worse death further on. The sting of death is sin, so let us thank God that we have the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so the women now have heard that he's risen from the dead. Uh, they've been invited to come and see, but they're not allowed to stay there and just sort of uh, enjoy this thing. They're told immediately to go and tell. Now watch, come and see, go and tell. This is the Easter message. Come and check out the facts. Find out for yourself that this is reality. And as soon as you realize this is reality, go and tell others because this is the greatest thing that ever happened on this planet. It was unimaginable until now. It was unimaginable to anybody. And so go and tell is actually terribly important. And these women have to become the angels of the resurrection to the church. An angel means a messenger. So the angel from heaven declares uh, the reality of the resurrection to the women, and the women are told to declare it to the church, and the church has to declare it to the world. Now you go to the other gospels for the reaction of the apostles to the women, not dealing with that because it's not in Matthew. Okay, uh, so go quickly and tell his disciples he has risen from the dead, and now he is going before you into Galilee. It is there that you will see him. And I love this statement. Now I've told you. I think it's brilliant. In other words, it's so simple. Weren't you expecting it? He told you five times. I mean, how often do you have to be told? But if something is so outlandish as a resurrection, the mind finds it very difficult to just take on board, okay? So the women become the first missionaries of the risen Lord, simply because they're there. They are the first witnesses. Now, I've told you before why they have to go and meet in Galilee, but I have to 
put something else in there. Uh, I told you already from um, Isaiah chapter 9 that Galilee was the place that had been assigned to uh, Zebulon and Naphtali, uh, that it was Galilee of the nations, that the Jews and the Gentiles uh, lived there quite happily. It was an intercultural place. Um, and so it represented the mission to all the world. But there's an added problem here. Why would you have to go to Galilee when Jesus can be appear anywhere, anytime? No problem. He doesn't have to travel to Galilee. He's outside of our dimensions of time and space. So he can be anywhere he wants to be. So why is he insisting on this? He's insisting on this because uh, of what I've already said from Isaiah chapter nine, uh, and also because uh, the first disciples were all from Galilee. Jesus had done an enormous amount of ministry in Galilee. He had begun, he had launched his whole mission in Galilee, and he wants Galilee to be the stepping stone to the rest of the world, that what we did there, you do to all the other nations. So when he says, um, I will meet, I'm going before you into Galilee, he's saying something much bigger than the words give you the impression of. He's really saying, get on the roads to the world, start the mission now. I told you that in the agony in the garden, as soon as Jesus was able to say his final yes to God, that Satan gave him no time, he had to get on with the passion. And here we find that as soon as Jesus rises from the dead, the uh, apostles and the disciples are given no time. They have a lot of recovery to do. Uh, they have a lot of time to, to make up because they've not been around and yet they're given no time. They're told, get on with it, start your mission, get out into the whole world. It's fascinating. The fact that they're, they're not even ready doesn't make any difference. Jesus says, start now, the whole world is to be conquered and that's that. I think that's absolutely brilliant. And so the angel said, go quickly and tell the disciples. Now, they're to go quickly for several reasons. Uh, one is don't stay around here enjoying uh, the thing yourselves. Uh, you've got to tell them, they've got to take it on board, they've got to receive it, they've got to respond, and they have got to start obeying. They must obey the risen Lord. Because from, from here on in, the sign of love is obedience. And this will be emphasized by, by Jesus himself. This comes out very strongly in John's gospel, uh, but Matthew just gives it to us very succinctly. That <clears throat> some kind of an emotional staying here uh, with all the events of the passion and the resurrection, that's not what it's all about. What it's about is that now that you know that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that he is the Messiah and that he is the savior of the whole world, now it's the time to go. So remember the message of the resurrection is come and see, find out, check everything, then go and tell. The time of the resurrection is not the time for sitting back and enjoying ourselves. Uh, there is a whole world out there to be saved and Jesus wants everyone to be saved, not you. Not just you, I should say, uh, and not just me. Everybody else has exactly the same value as you and me. And so he wants us to love our neighbor as he loves us and that we should love them as much as we love ourselves. So if we want to go to heaven, we've got to reach out and get them by the hand and take them with us to heaven as well. That's Easter, that the joy spreads, that the liberation spreads, that the happiness spreads, that the freedom spreads, and that eventually the whole world gets up and goes back to God. Thank you for listening. Sloan August Bannock, they live. Goodbye. God bless you. I spent much of my 39 years as a priest working with young people and I've constantly found young people to be wonderful, yearning for something beautiful in their lives, yearning for peace, 
yearning for shalom. That's why I really hope that Shalom uh, Media will be able to communicate that message of hope to young people who are told to expect so little from themselves. And so I really wish the blessing of God to come on all of you who follow the programs with Shalom Media to ensure that young people will hear the good news of the gospel about a God who believes in us. So with that in mind, we ask the blessing of the Lord on Shalom and all that it does and on all of you who follow its programs right around the world. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.